Well, thank you. It's an, it's an honor to be here. And um, it's great being able to follow Dr. Ray. He had uh, been kind enough to contact me and let me and tip me off that uh, we were sharing sort of similar topics and uh, provide me with his slides. Uh, so I made an effort to not have too much overlap uh, with this. Uh, like Dr. Nelson, who started us off, I have a little bit of a cold uh, and a cough, so I decided to forego the tie today so I didn't have a big coughing jag as we were going here. All right. There we go. Okay, I have no disclosures. What I want to do that's a little bit different than what Dr. Ray uh, did for his talk is first talk a little bit about the morbidity and mortality uh, that's associated with uh, these congenital cardiac defects and uh, really focus in on the uh, area of labor and delivery and the impact of these lesions and in doing that, go over sort of general principles of management, knowing that each one of these lesions, and even for the same lesion, there's incredible variation from person to person that you're going to manage. So this is data uh, from the CDC. I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before, although this is the more recent one. If you looked uh, just a few months ago, it was the 2006 to 2010 data. This is the 11 to 13 data. And what you notice is that on the left side of the graph, uh, still the number one sort of killer for maternal mortality is cardiovascular disease. Right after that is non-cardiovascular disease. Uh, so sort of my take home point from this is a lot of the things that are contributing to mortality in women during pregnancy are things that were pre-existing. They're not the hemorrhage or the cardiomyopathy of pregnancy or the PEs or uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancies. There's things, they're mainly things that now uh, were pre-existing prior to the pregnancy itself. And obviously we're gonna concentrate on cardiovascular disease. Okay. So um, this again is a spread. I just have a nice table here of the prevalence, as you saw mentioned before, the number one is the VSD. And then as we go down, uh, luckily the cyanotic disorders uh, become a little less frequent. Just to give you an idea on sort of the mortality of this, um, if you had a patient, uh, or I should say uh, infants born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome on average currently only live about 14 days, whereas people born with ASDs live into their 70s, to just give you some uh, little idea of the spectrum of the severity of these congenital heart defects. Okay. So before we go into uh, the specifics of management, I think it's, it's worthwhile just pausing for a moment and thinking about the physiologic changes of pregnancy. I'm sure they're all familiar to you, but uh, for this talk, it's worth reviewing them. Hemodynamically, uh, as you can see on this graph, you have this increase in cardiac output uh, that goes up uh, with gestation, and a term reaches about 50% of the cardiac output greater uh, than it was in its pre-pregnancy value. You have increases in both heart rate and stroke volume, stroke volume, uh, being the larger player contributing to the cardiac output. And of course, you have different uh, decreases in the SVR. So all of these uh, will affect individuals that have congenital uh, heart defects. What we find out is that some of the lesions that do the worst are the ones that uh, really limit uh, the, the cardiac output or end up uh, creating more flow through the pulmonary arteries with pregnancy and increasing pulmonary hypertension. Other considerations on labor and delivery. With delivery, as you know, you have uh, this further increase in the circulating volume uh, above the hypervolemic uh, status of just pregnancy itself. 
happening really immediately after delivery, but even labor itself with each contraction, you typically have uh, 300 to 500 cc's of blood placed back in the circulation with the contraction of the uterus. This, of course, uh, strains a lot of the congenital heart lesions. Pain and anxiety can contribute, uh, increasing the heart rate, making it difficult uh, to have adequate filling, uh, increasing the SVR. Changes in oxygen demand, uh, it makes determining the status of the individual very difficult because obviously with a term pregnancy, uh, many women already have shortness of breath, um, which then might in a non-pregnant individual tip you off to exacerbation of their underlying cardiac condition, but here making it more difficult to determine what's going on. CO2 um, obviously is initially lowered in pregnancy, uh, but because of its role in the constriction of the pulmonary vasculature, if it were to go up, the acute changes that occur in labor and delivery can really change the hemodynamics. And then there's the elevated clotting factors and the increased risk of thromboembolic events. Um, for all comers with congenital heart defects, the rate of having some sort of thromboembolic event is about 2%. So it's markedly higher than just the general pregnant population, which is more like one in a thousand. And uh, nothing is more demoralizing than to have a great multidisciplinary approach where you've worked very hard getting someone uh, with a very severe cardiac lesion through labor and delivery, through uh, a shor short postpartum period, have them go home only to have a PE and, uh, and mortality. Other things to think about are the fluid mobilization uh, that's occurring, not just the changes in volume around the delivery, but also in the postpartum period, uh, not trivializing the fluid shifts that it can occur on postoperative day one, two, and three. Okay. So this is just a slide to give you a nice spectrum of all the types of congenital heart disease. Uh, in general, as a category, we have mild, moderate, and severe. And you can see sort of the septal defects in the mild, uh, unless they're larger, they would be considered moderate, sort of the valve lesions, stenotic lesions in the moderate, and then really the cyanotic defects uh, in the more severe area that Dr. Ray uh, went through the physiology and surgical correction of many of these. So as far as risk stratification goes, uh, I have a about the next three slides are on this uh, with different scoring systems. So this is the WHO's classification. And you can see uh, from the table that they focus primarily on a combination of what the underlying disorder is. Uh, you can see VSDs, PDAs, repaired ASDs, Fontans, right ventricle supporting the systemic circulation, as well as the status. So does the patient have arrhythmias? How severe is the ventricular dysfunction? Um, Marfan sort of gets its own classification if it's greater than four centimeters. And when you look at class one to four, class one is really no significant risk above baseline pregnant women. Two is a mild increased risk. You could say maybe less than 5% increased risk of a complication. Class three, you're starting to get above 10%. Class four is actually contraindications to pregnancy. Right? Unfortunately, that can be very difficult to control as still in the US, over half of the pregnancies are unplanned. So although we would like to have counseling beforehand and, and we do make that attempt, um, a lot of times you have lesions that you really wish the patient had not become pregnant with. Other scoring systems, <clears throat> This is the CARPREG scoring system, uh, risk assessment. The reason I have these up here is, again, because I want you to think about not just what the lesion is when you get one of these patients, but just knowing the spectrum within that lesion and how you would evaluate it. So with this scoring system, you want to look at left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Each one of these gives you a point, one, two, three, and four. If you have one of these four, you get a point for each one and then that's predictive of the cardiac event. So things in this scoring system are left ventricular dysfunction, 
uh, left outflow tract obstruction, you get into your stenotic valves, uh, mitral valves and aortic valves giving you points. Uh, previous cardiac events, sort of how well the patient was doing uh, going into the pregnancy. Were they already in heart failure, having TIAs, a history of arrhythmias or strokes? And then what is their uh, cardiac functional status? Having a functional status of three and four uh, is not good. Or a cyanotic lesion that's not corrected uh, with SATs less than 90, that would give you a point. So you can see that if you have none of these, um, but you have a, um, a heart lesion, it's just 5%. But it goes up pretty rapidly. One point gets you all the way to 27%. And if you get two of these, uh, by this scoring system, you're up at 70%. Now there's another scoring system that came out later that takes into account not only sort of what your functional status is, your left uh, ventricular outflow tract, um, but also starts to look down at the bottom of did you need cardiac medication prior to the pregnancy for your heart defect? Um, cyanosis, heart, cyanotic heart disease gets its own point. Having uh, valve regurgitation gets you a little bit of points, but one of the biggest is the need, your underlying uh, anomaly requiring a mechanical heart valve gets you four points in itself, right? So you can see uh, cardiac events in the box and how they go up uh, with the point scoring system. Well, since then, 2014, uh, a group out of the Netherlands uh, took about uh, 200 pregnant women who had a known congenital heart disease and they prospectively placed them on these two risk stratification scoring systems. And what you see, so you can see the CARPREG on the left in sort of an orange gold uh, and the ZARA in blue. And we see that for the more mild uh, status, individuals where we would have predicted like 5% on the CARPREG or 2.9 on the ZARA, it's actually worse. So we were kind of under predicting uh, the people with the more mild disease. But the good news was that for the people with the more severe disease where uh, they were having a, a very high expected cardiovascular risk at 70, um, it was actually slightly better. We have 40 on one and 33 on the other. So maybe we're doing a little bit better with the most severe disease uh, than we originally thought. Okay. And this is just, just, just a look by lesion. Um, you can see that the two number one complications that occur with uh, congenital heart defects are uh, arrhythmias and heart failure. You can see that the more moderate stenosis on the left, the ASDs, the VSDs, you have rates less than 5% for each one of these. But as soon as you start to get in the tetralogy of flow and the cyanotic lesions, you have uh, markedly increased rates of arrhythmia and then heart failure also. So these are the two things we're always worried about when we have pregnant women laboring uh, with these underlying cardiac defects. Dr. Ray already spoke about endocarditis and the new guidelines. Uh, definitely something that should be considered for every one of these patients. Pulmonary hypertension, depending on the defect. If you start to get increased flow through the pulmonary vasculature with the increasing cardiac output and volume status of pregnancy, uh, you can have a significantly worse cardiac condition of the individual. And you're going to see this theme of thromboembolic events uh, over and over just to always keep it on your mind. Okay. So I have a similar slide uh, to Dr. Ray's, but it was interesting. He has the multidisciplinary anesthesiologist slide, and I purposely left it at just one line. But when we take care of a lot of these severe defects, hypoplastic left hearts, Fontans, we do have a cardi an adult cardiac a PD cardiac, an obstetric anesthesiologist, all involved in the care, obstetricians, labor nurses, uh, critical care teams, not just the critical care physician, but critical care nurses who are often caring for the individual after the delivery, um, a multitude of cardiologists, neonatologists. 
We like to involve CT surgery early on if we think it's a severe lesion that might need some sort of ECMO or uh, bypass considerations because they have their own surgical schedules and uh, that will come into planning also. Plenty of other specialties uh, from ultrasonographers to pulmonologists and so on. And uh, you know, the key to this is not just having a lot of meetings, but having meetings that are actually meaningful where there's good communication. And uh, that is often the problem I find where uh, just having a meeting doesn't really solve the problem. You have to have a very meaningful meeting that's well planned out where you're thinking about all the different aspects of the care and you have a plan not just for a planned delivery, but what about an emergent situation? What if the patient comes in unoptimized because they went into preterm labor and thinking sort of through all of those pathways so that uh, you're not surprised. This is just sort of a blow up slide of that category four of the WHO. Uh, again, high risk uh, pregnancy where if you had uh, some sort of way to meaningfully counsel a patient prior to getting pregnant, uh, these are underlying diagnosis where pregnancy really is somewhat contraindicated. Um, and with this, if the patient wanted to get pregnant, you could possibly go in and intervene. You could take care of stenotic valves. You could um, replace that dilated aortic root. Uh, you could have ablation therapy for those arrhythmias uh, so that they would have a much better chance at having a great outcome with pregnancy. But as I said before, many pregnancies are unplanned, so you just need to look at this slide to know when you should be incredibly concerned about a pregnant woman with these underlying disorders. Eisenmenger syndrome itself at the top there uh, in some studies has a 50% mortality rate with pregnancy, just to give you an idea of an extreme. Okay. So what I wanted to do um, was choose a couple of defects uh, that Dr. Ray had not uh, already gone through and try to pick some that I think that you'll see uh, more in the community uh, as opposed to those of you at academic centers. So I thought I'd just start with an atrial septal defect, right? Pretty common. Uh, you saw that it's fairly common, not quite as common as a VSD, but uh, I think a lot of us think of them and we're like, oh, it's no big deal. Like a lot of people have these. Um, and this goes to my point that the same defect can have a huge spectrum, right? If this is um, surgically corrected and there's no defect uh, because they went in but put a clamshell in or something, then um, there is no difference in the risk of pregnancy. But if it's open and uncorrected, um, then there can be a huge variation. And some of these can be so big that they lead to uh, right heart failure, uh, they can lead to pulmonary hypertension, and in rare circumstances, they can even lead to Eisenmenger syndrome. So consequently, uh, one of my points of this is that if you have an ASD which hasn't been worked up and wasn't uh, repaired, you definitely want to uh, have echocardiography to determine uh, what's going on, right? You want to look at those PA pressures and uh, the size of the defect. Unfortunately, uh, some ASDs are very well tolerated until the fourth decade of life or until someone gets pregnant. They didn't even know they had the ASD, uh, but the demands of pregnancy uh, then sort of bring it to light. Some just general concepts with it. Uh, you obviously want to maintain uh, preload if you have a significant ASD. No bubbles in the venous lines. Um, Obviously, that's uh, regardless of whether you're in OB anesthesia or not, that would be something you would think of. But particular to OB anesthesia, I, I didn't put a, a picture from the study here, but there was a 1995 study by uh, Jaffe that is quoted in Chestnut and in some of the review articles on caring for these patients where they took um, individuals and placed lumbar epidurals and then um, had them go to sleep um, for having surgery under general anesthesia with a lumbar epidural, put a uh, transesophageal echo down and injected five cc's of air into the epidural catheter, which was not intravenous. 
um, and they could immediately see micro bubbles uh, in the circulation. So uh, interestingly, in Chestnut and some of the review articles, and this is my practice, in individuals that have ASDs, uh, I don't do loss of resistance to my epidural with air. Okay? So something else you might want to think about. Common complications you might see with the ASDs, arrhythmias at the top, both supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Rates of preeclampsia, just by having an ASD that's unrepaired, are about 3.5 uh, times relative risk of individuals that don't have ASDs who get pregnant. Small for gestational age infants, uh, that's about two times greater of having a small uh, baby. Fetal mortality for having an uncorrected ASD is a five times relative risk. Right? Don't really know the mechanism of that, uh, maybe some sort of cyanotic component to it, um, but that's what it is. Luckily, paradoxical embolism with an uncorrected ASD of s clinical significance is still less than 1%. Okay. So I thought I'd choose another example, uh, Tetralogy of Fallot, right? As pointed out earlier, the most common cyanotic disorder, uh, congenital heart disorder uh, we have. In the U.S., the vast, vast majority of these are corrected. To just kind of go through this again, uh, you can see there you have a VSD, you have a pulmonic stenosis, you have sort of an overriding aorta, which is sort of positioned directly over uh, the VSD, and then you have ventricular uh, hypertrophy. Typically, the uh, VSD is uh, repaired uh, as well as the uh, pulmonic stenosis, uh, so you have separation of the chambers again. Again, one repaired tetralogy of Fallot can be completely different than another repaired tetralogy of Fallot. And I've seen this even on our own service where we'll have a string over a year of three or four repaired tets and everything will go fine. And the reason it, it went fine is because they don't have any residual pulmonary valve insufficiency. They don't have RV dilation and dysfunction. And in those, you could almost argue you don't need any more extra invasive monitoring. They go so well, right? But then you'll come along and have a tetralogy of Fallot that has significant pulmonary valve insufficiency or a very bad right heart. And then you may want to pull out all the stops on the monitoring and uh, the supervision of that labor and delivery. So again, I, I want you to both break them apart by lesion and I always think about, well, I have this lesion, but how is it doing? Right. If the patient doesn't have pulmonary hypertension, has a good right ventricle, uh, it's incredibly well tolerated in pregnancy if you have this corrected lesion. Um, but if those two things are not the case, uh, you definitely can have a decent chance of right-sided heart failure. 20% of the patients uh, in that category can end up with some sort of left-sided heart failure too. And arrhythmias are common. Right? When do we see the arrhythmias? We see them most frequently in these diseases right after delivery. The idea is you have that big fluid shift, you stretch both the atrium and the ventricle a little bit, and it throws off the conducting system, and that's when you get your arrhythmias. So, <clears throat> now I want to go back and just kind of generalize the approach, knowing that it's going to be different for every lesion and even different with each individual within each lesion. So it's like individualized, multidisciplinary care. Ideally, you'd really like to get these uh, pregnant women uh, referred to high-risk specialists as soon as possible. Um, that is echoed in the ASA guidelines, trying to get early and frequent consultation. Um, those of us in academia, uh, have a huge luxury where I, I have fellows, we have a high-risk clinic, we actually have a clinic where we coordinate with cardiology and OB and these patients get seen for like one-stop shopping. They come in and they're seen by all the disciplines, echoes are done uh, and, and it's really amazing and I think they get great care. I realize that is not, that luxury is not the case in the majority of places. But I think what you do want to have is some sort of system in place. Someone who, when the obstetrician gets a patient who has some sort of congenital heart defect or 
we can even broaden it to some sort of significant uh, disease process, they have a point person to go to. It could be someone that they're going to call. It could be that a couple days a month on L&D you have sort of a, a clinic that you run where they can refer them to. Uh, just some sort of uh, standard uh, that they can follow to uh, get them to bring the patients to you early on. Besides the multidisciplinary approach, you want early, early cardiac assessment, uh, echoes, often serial echoes for the disease severity and to see how it's progressing through the pregnancy, um, to know if the patient has arrhythmias, not just a snapshot single 12 lead EKG, but potentially wearing a single lead patch over time uh, so you can see if there's frequent arrhythmias going on uh, beyond what you're finding with your history. Maybe bringing them in early to optimize their volume status, or if they are having arrhythmias, putting them on something like beta blockade, thinking about early thromboprophylaxis and how the fetus is tolerating the pregnancy. Intrapartum, even though it's one of the least common things, I put it first, because if you don't think about it right away, it's the hardest to coordinate, and that again is your CT surgeons and some sort of extracorporeal uh, support for these individuals if needed. Um, talked about endocarditis prophylaxis earlier. We're gonna get to mode of delivery, but neuroaxial not just for C-sections, but also for labor analgesia, probably most importantly, uh, because it may be able to blunt some of the tachycardia and responses uh, to pain. Again, in most of these patients, uh, if you use neuroaxial blockade for either analgesia or anesthesia in the case of a C-section, as most of you know, it would be a very sort of slow, gentle blockade. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is we not only do epidurals, but uh, we've been taking uh, the DPE, just the dural puncture epidural, uh, and using that, where you make a small puncture with a spinal needle, to increase your chance of having a good block. Postpartum hemorrhage planning. Again, where's the patient gonna go postpartum? If they go to the unit, you probably need an L&D nurse there who's familiar with looking at postpartum blood loss. If you decide to labor them on the ward or see them postpartum on your, on your L&D unit, Maybe you want to bring a critical care nurse there who's more familiar with the pressors that you're going to use or the invasive monitoring uh, that might be in use. So there's uh, a team approach with nursing too. Other things to think about are uh, methogen, hemabate, prostaglandin E1, because they all have effects on not only the systemic vascular resistance, but often the uh, pulmonary resistance too, and what's going to be appropriate for what lesion. And then uh, at these multidisciplinary meetings, all the planning around delivery that I alerted, alluded to earlier. Monitoring, uh, just some general recommendations, thinking about who needs continuous tele, who's at high risk for some sort of uh, incident where you would need defibrillation, uh, cyanotic patients having continuous pulse oximetry to monitor uh, their sort of flow through their lesion, A-line CVP catheters. We rarely use PA catheters, but uh, the one area we do use them in is titration of pulmonary agents for people with significant pulmonary hypertension. And uh, having a plan, I believe, for echocardiography readily available, uh, not just for the cardiac status, but sometimes just for the volume status of the patient. How are you gonna deliver? Um, the reference I have down there is a really nice meta-analysis that came out in 2013 that looked at uh, well over 100 studies of pregnant women with congenital heart defects and ended up with 29,000 patients in the meta-analysis. It was huge. And uh, in general, could not find a significant difference between cesarean delivery and vaginal delivery. In general, I would say that we are always trying for a vaginal delivery. Uh, you're gonna have less blood loss, less wound infection, less complications, earlier ambulation, and I think that's good. Uh, the downside is the planning. As you know, the labor and induction of labor uh, 
can sometimes take days. And having this giant team of CT surgeons and cardiologists and uh, uh, many anesthesiologists, MFMs, around and ready to go uh, for days 24-7 can be difficult. So sometimes, uh, just for that reason, in the more significant lesions, um, cesarean section may be chosen. Postpartum, I uh, alluded to this a little bit, but uh, thromboprophylaxis. I'm going to encourage you to uh, listen to the lecture by Alex Butwick on the last day on Sunday. He's going to go over the new safety bundle uh, devoted to VTE prophylaxis, and I've spoken with him a couple months ago because he's on the CMQCC effort, the California effort for that. Uh, I know it will be a great lecture and go over all the current guidelines um, again, follow-up planning, how long should you be monitoring these patients post-op, how many days, how, how long in the unit, how long on the ward, when should you send them home, and what's their follow-up, and what kind of services do they have uh, where they live. Um, I will tell you, we've had over the, I've been almost 15 years at UCSF, we've had two deaths uh, from congenital heart disease and labor and delivery. They were all after the patient went home. So I can't stress it enough that the plan doesn't end when they leave the hospital. Just really briefly uh, to give you sort of a teaser to Alex's lecture, uh, there's the safety bundle, the ACOGS behind, um, and just this idea that we're coming more and more, if it's a cesarean delivery, delivery to almost an opt-out strategy where the default should be some sort of anticoagulation until the patient is up and ambulating. Right? And just to give you uh, one uh, recommendation that I know will be a slide that he has, looking at major risk factors and minor risk factors for cesarean section patients, the recommendation is if they have even one major risk factor, they should be on some sort of low molecular weight heparin. And you see their heart disease is one major risk factor. So again, uh, sort of driving home the anticoagulation. Finally, practice points, just to reiterate, we need to be involved early on uh, as part of a multidisciplinary approach. You really want clear management strategies thought out for non-urgent planned, urgent situations, emergent situations. Um, epidural analgesia is rarely contraindicated and can be of huge benefit in controlling the heart rate and the pain response. And we have no evidence supporting either general or regional as being superior if a cesarean delivery is performed, so you're going to use your best clinical judgment. And thank you. <laughs>